So, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, everybody. Uh, you all know me, I'm Michael Feeney, I'm the Barcelona idiot uh, that does the Barcelona Dream articles, and, uh, and I'm mad about trying to get boards into, into Ireland from Barcelona. I have here with me uh, a gentleman, Christy Daly. Um, I've known Christy Daly all my life. Uh, Christy Daly lived local to me where I grew up, knows my father very well, grew up raising pigeons from where I, li where I lived. Um, Christy is actually a son, or the father and son partnership of Christy Daly and son way back in 19, what was it, what was the 68, clock? 1968 when they got a cock to fly Barcelona in yeah. record time, the Palamas, 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 yeah. Palamas, sorry I always say Barcelona but it actually, it was originally intended to be Barcelona Bar but they moved it to Palamas, Palamas yeah. and uh, 918. 918 miles into Dublin. Record time of 12 days. Amazing. Absolutely amazing stuff. So I met Christy a couple of years ago when I was starting on this road uh, just offhand. And we had a, 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 bit, a brief chat and I, I had meant to do an article before I was even doing these videos. I meant to do an article uh, about the board and about Christy, uh, it's Christy's involvement. And just time got away from me and I forgot. And as you know, stuff has happened over the last year or so. But I saw an article on Facebook of Christie's father talking about him remembering the times and all of that uh, about the boards and about the boards coming from Palamas into into Dublin and, and the racing that they did, Christie's father did with his father, Cocker Daly, who was a very successful fancier here in Dublin back in the day. Um, so with that in mind then, I got in contact with the guy who had the photograph, I got in contact with a friend of Christie's and I actually found out where he was and just lo and behold, even... Before that, bumped into him only a few days ago, last week, wasn't last it? Week. A few days ago, bumped into him when I was doing something myself and just happened to cross paths. So I've arranged to do this for today. So I suppose we'll start with, with, with the usual interview, start with your life and boards. And I mean, we've already mentioned you're three generations now. You're the third generation, generation of Pigeon Fancy. Yeah. And there is a fourth generation already. And there is a fourth generation. There we yeah. go. Uh, Christy's, I actually know Christy's nephew, so I'll be giving you a call. <laughs> later on um so i suppose the way to start is i suppose we'll start with, with the cock himself and the cock was a, a what what year was the cock born uh how was he bred nuhw uh, 62 1962 so 1962. yeah and so uh, so i'm, I'm gonna start, hand this over to you now so you tell us his story the cock's story and and how he's ended up going to Palamas with him? Yeah, well, he hatched out in 1962. Uh, he was a good racer as a, year, a yearling. Didn't didn't break any big deals or anything like that. But he was a consistent racer, uh, and as a yearling, he was sent to Saint Malo now. St. Mallow was a disaster. Uh, it was actually won here in in, in uh, Ireland by uh, a cousin of Joe Donnie's, I believe, uh, Roy of Balbriggan. But and that, that was a great pigeon. But uh, there was very very few pigeons made it to where it was. A, they were left out in, in the gale, I believe. I've seen photographs of pigeons sitting on stones near the beach and all that, you know, in a distressed condition. But, uh, and was that the King's Cup that year? Uh, from St. Mallow, no, it would have been in the same jurisdiction as, say, St. Mallow, Sartilly, Denard. Yeah, yeah. You know, around the same distance. But uh, the King's Cup would always be Nantes, uh, the Sables, and, and that. Slightly further. Yeah, well, yeah. further, yeah. But uh, we got him on. Uh, we got him on the fourth morning. Now he was a dark check cock when we sent him, but he was a red check cock when we got him back. He had dried blood all around his front and around his head and all that, and uh, his keel bone was badly damaged. But but he he made it. But he was to home from. Uh, the King's Cup race uh, twice and uh, on, on two occasions I believe 
he was the only pigeon into uh, Southern Ireland, into the Republic. But my father sent him, got him ready then for um, for Palamas. Uh, first of all, he had sent him the previous year from the British and Irish Steamship Company and uh, to London where the marking was going on. He didn't go with it himself, but he sent details and all that. Unfortunately, there was a mishap there and uh, his pigeon wasn't sent to Barcelona. So we got him back. The, the British and Irish Steamship Company was able to ring my dad in Dublin and uh, we were told that he, Through accident, that the pigeon had been left on the station in now, in the UK in, in, the port in, 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 in London, yes, okay, in London where the marking was going on. But so I drove me that down to the B and I British and Irish Steamship Company, and we we collected. He was still in the box, so uh, he was very thirsty and very hungry and that was uh, 12 days later he was in time to send them to the King's Cup race and uh, he had a bet with Frank Andrews. Frank Andrews had a very good red chair cock and Frank and him had a bet that they were going to get their pigeon forced. Uh, Frank's pigeon and Frank was a very good pigeon man and a very nice gentleman. Frank's pigeon didn't make it and he paid me father the best <laughs> because their pigeon was then the first pigeon into Southern Ireland, or only pigeon into Southern Ireland, and but again, <clears throat> just out of race time. But as I say, this pigeon had a smashed keel. So but smashed keel as he, a yearling? Yeah, I don't know. Well, he, he would have been he would have been two year old now at this time, or maybe three year old. But a year or two later, he sent them back to be marked for the Barcelona race, uh, and which was Palamas then, and uh, we got him on the 12th day. So 12 days mm -hmm. into Dublin from Palamas at 918 miles. I mean, it just beggars belief, absolutely beggars belief. Um, you mentioned that the pigeon went over uh, by the B&O Steamship Company at the time. Yeah. So there were steamships back then, it was oh, yeah. 1968. Yeah. So a 62 pigeon, six year old, six year old, uh, had flown already Penzance as a a, a, a yearling, yearling probably. Yeah. Uh, then Denard as a yearling. Uh, yeah, well, Saint, Saint Mallow, Saint, Saint Mallow as a yearling, came back smashed up on the fourth day. Yeah. Uh, as a two year old, then was sent back again. Yeah, yeah. For the next couple of years, he was sent. The next year, three years, he was sent to the King's Cup. Race. So he, so he did. So he did St. Mallow and then he did three King's Cups consecutively on consecutive years. Yes, yes. And that brings us up to his five years of age coming home from the Tour King's Cup after flying France now four times. Yes. And I'm sure in the meantime, um, like everybody racing at that time, he had his build-up races, he had his usual whatever land races we did here in Ireland at the time, and I'm sure they're the tallest... Uh, Waterford, Tremor, yeah. uh, Mallow, the build-ups, and then you probably did, he was obviously probably raced Penzance that year as well before he went on to the King's Cup. So was he just jumped straight into the King's Cup from Ireland? No, he would be he would be jumped into the King's Cup race right. from Ireland. And you he, know, do you remember what kind of build-up races you would have done for him, or what his what, what his prep would have been, as it were? Well, we would give him any forty mile tosses we could get, and I had the car that time. I was able to drive, drive down to Kildare Pass to cut it and liberate him, um, with, uh, let the young birds go and then liberate him on his own. So he was single tossed at 40 single hours. And uh, for a few weekends coming up to the Palamas race, I would drive to Cork and single him up from Cork, just outside the station at Cork <sighs> City. And... Uh, <sighs> So he was coming from Cork to oh, Dublin, yeah, and, and two hundred miles, yeah, on his own, yeah, for three or four weeks before he was marked yes, yeah. for Palamas, yeah. Well, but, but he was sent. My father sent him unmated. He wasn't mated when he when he sent him. He, 
because uh, my father only had to say up to him and he would fly from the floor up to his to his uh, little stand outside his nest box the door actually of the nest box and he would coo at my father you know wow. so my father came, and my father was always dubious about feeding pigeons and maize because depending on where it was stored if it was stored in any damp conditions you could see if you looked at the kernel of the maize you'd see some pieces that would be blue and, and, and that indicated to my father that there was possibly fungus going through mm -hmm. the, yeah. the maize so he was always very he would give him get pick good maize and the, the Palamas cock loved the maize and so when he would go up to his box as my father would tell him to the father would give him three or four pieces of maize you know and that, that's just interesting what you talk there really, because like at the moment uh, in this day and age there's all the different various mixes from all the different companies you can buy mm -hmm. and back then in the 60s here in Ireland it was 20 years after the war time 25 years after the war time everything was settling down again what kind of feeds were available what what, what, what was the general feed for the boards well ma maple peas as I remember it was and they're, they're high in protein mm -hmm. uh, Good, good maize, uh, linseed, especially for their coat, it's full of vitamin B and certain oils and all that, linseed, flaxseed, uh, clean water, and uh, he would chop up garlic sometimes and pour honey over it and put the linseed around that and let it dry and mix it in. Uh, you know amazing 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 um something else you mentioned there actually uh, uh so the cock was sent over for palamas market or barcelona market yeah. twice and the fourth time there was an error with the shipping company was left uh, in the yes, station, left in the the station. Market. yeah and you then got him back was it a week later or it was about days four, four, uh, four or five days later and he was in the box with no food and more yeah, for exactly. four or five days exactly. wow absolutely bonkers well someone had thrown a sandwich in <laughs> Someone probably one of the the the, uh, the the dockers or something at the time, or somebody who saw him there probably. Well, it would mean at the railway station yeah. where the marking was done. So maybe some of the the porters from the English okay. chaps would have thrown a sandwich into him. And so he got, so the, so the board got a sandwich to yeah. keep him going for a few yeah. days. Amazing, um, and so the second year you sent him over with, with the BNI steam company again. He got to no, my father went over. Oh, the father went over the second year. Yeah. And how, okay, so logistically, how did that work for us? Because I know I've done research the cost of what it costs now for us to get a board to market over there now. What, what, what did it involve for you guys at the time? You know, obviously you obviously had to get a ferry over. There was a train down to London. Yeah, well, my dad went over on his own. I was okay. working on the docks, so okay. uh, my dad done all that. And what, what, so, so what did, so, but the logistics that were involved in it, so we had to book a ferry, pay for the ferry, yes, and us, yeah. Uh, had to get a train then from the ferry. I'm assuming we went to Hollyhead, it didn't go direct to London, or did he go direct to London? Do you remember? I'm, I'm not sure now, right? And then he could have got a plane across now to London. Oh, would it? Uh, and that, well, he could have, I'm uh, not, I don't right, remember. Okay, that, you know? and do you remember the cost of sending the boards to races? No, days? I don't. Yeah. Think I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, that, that's just. That's just. That's that's just. It's it's bonkers. Yeah. So I'm just. I'm actually going to show you a picture of the cock here because I have it here. And um, so this is actually a picture of the cock. I'm going to show you. His, he was, as you said, a Czech cock. Dark Czech cock. Dark Czech cock. He flew uh, Saint Malo as a yearling and came back smashed up after four days, but was covered in blood. Yeah. Uh, as Chrissy has told us, covered right. in blood. And right. um, lovely, a lovely cock by the looks of it here. To be honest with you. Um, so, and then from, from there on, he, he he had done three King's Cups afterwards, uh, plus all the build-up races. As Christy has said then, he was, on the year he was sent to Palamas, there was two years he was sent to Palamas, it was a mistake the first year, but the second year then, Christy himself drove down to Cork for three or four weekends yeah. before yeah. marking for Palamas, yeah. and yeah. Had, had singled up 200 miles, pumped it up in a straight line, you know, probably flew 250 miles himself right. in, in getting home. Yeah. And then 
Chris's father brought the board over for marketing, which would have been around, I would say, the end of June uh, at the time. Would have been that, that was that's normally mm, the race time yes. now. So I'm assuming yeah. it was something similar back then. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a there's a promo there from from the Barcelona club. Um, let's see. We just have a few. We've got a paraphernalia here. Uh, no, it's not no, that's not. It's not here. I, I'll be getting more paraphernalia off Christy. But uh, this is this is an interesting one here. This is just a. Uh, uh, a copy of the article that was wrote Spain to Dublin uh, about Christie's uh, Christie's dad's board co coming home. Um, amazingly enough, I I'll put this into this video so you will be able to see it. Um, and if it's okay, I'm going to put a copy of it out there if that's, that's okay with that's you okay. as well. Yeah. Um, so talk us through how the board was bred, because obviously Christie and I just had a, had a brief conversation uh, before we started this, and we talked about. Just breeding, and Christy just mentioned something about how they inbred very closely uh, in his line of boards, uh, right up until Christy finished with his own pigeons in 1990, obviously. Yeah, 1998. 1998. Yes. Um, 1998, 1999. Yeah. Because, and I remember actually Christy finishing up on the boards back then because I was still here uh, in Dunicarney at the time. So, so talk me about, talk, talk us through his breeding. Like, I mean, something special because the sprint boards now we all know they just come. You know, it is about habit for them, uh, but the further the distance you go with pigeons, it's more it's more the board that does the work rather than rather than the fancier, as I would say. Yes. It's, it's the system that helps the sprint pigeon. But when it comes to pigeons, don't make mistakes flying nine hundred miles. They, they, they. <laughs> <laughs> so talk us through his breeding. How was he bred? What was the line of pigeon? What kind? You know, what what was the family lines? If you remember that just had in those days. Um, was there a cross in his recent history? What, was he inbred himself? Oh, um, he was very inbred. Okay. Uh, his sire was a red pied cock of uh, Cornell Osmond. Uh, my grandfather, who started the pigeons in around 1895, 1896, uh, he bought from, from uh, Cornell Osmond and uh, J.W. Taft of Liverpool. Um, there was an introduction of from Johnny Berry of Lark Hill or Lark Hall in Scotland, who proved to be a very, very good introduction. But when we got the cock from, from uh, Palamas, uh, I was having a drink with my father in the Ramble Inn and Donny Carney, and uh, I asked my dad about his pedigree. So the barman, uh, Michael, gave us a huge uh, beer mat, as it was called, that they use on the top of the funnels, uh, pouring beer from one cask into another. But it was huge. But he started off, and my father had a great memory for, for numbers and all that. But he started off, but there was one pigeon came up about 15 or 16 times. Again, he had finished going out, mother and father, mm. so, mother and father, mother and father, so on. He covered the entire, he covered the entire uh, huge bear mat. But the hen that's in the museum now, the 15 year old, or 14 year old hen, mealy hen, that, uh, was our second pigeon from Fraserburgh, who was uh, hatched in 1941, 1944. She was our second pigeon. Her grandson was our first pigeon, and she was right on his tail. That hen, that 14-year-old hen, was about 15 or 16 times, I remember my father's pinpointing it to me, at least 15 or 16 times in that... In the pedigree in, of this in, cock. In the pedigree of that one cock. Now, as I was explaining to Michael earlier on, my father was a true believer in inbreeding, but he said you had to take notice of any deterioration or lack of effort in your pigeons of when you needed a fresh cross, new blood. And his advice to me always was, if you're looking for a cross, go to a fancier, who has pins at least as good as your own, but preferably better if you can. Mm -hmm. And I think that was very, very good advice. So we did introduce an odd 
pitching in and they mostly proved successful. Mm, amazing. So the cock was was heavily blowing bread, we'll say, oh, because he was, was going he, back he, he was, yeah. to uh, a pigeon of Christie's at uh, 14 years of age, flew Fraser Yeah, she was 14 years of age. We had 12 pigeons away that day. 12 pigeons away. Christy and I were just talking. 12 pigeons away. Yeah. The first pigeon home was a grandson okay. of the 14 year old him. And she was right on his tail coming right, in. Right on his tail. At 14 years of age, after being in the stock loft and not raced for how many years? Two years she was. So she was two years stock. off the road. Yeah. So raced right up to she was 12 years of age before stopping for two yeah. years and back on the road. Yeah. We wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> we wouldn't dream of it nowadays. But like, you know, back in back 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 then, every board in the loft had to race. Nobody had had prisoner stock. Very very know. few, it? Very and, and they would have been retired racers that just were still flying out, probably. But yeah, oh raced, yes. You know, um, the health of the pigeons back then was far superior to what they are now. Anyway, there was there was very little medication available, and if it was available, it was very expensive. It was, um, yeah. at the time, um, and 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 like so, this cock flew Palamas at six years of age. Now, if that was me, and I ever get aboard from Barcelona. Um, it'll be getting locked up. <laughs> Never see the light day again. <laughs> However, back in those days, what happened to the cock afterwards? Well, after three or four days, he started to show signs of illness. So my father brought him up and we had the fire on, coal fire on at the time and uh, we put him in front of the fire. Now, at that time, my father had a good knowledge of medication and all that, but in this case, he didn't want to medicate the pigeon himself. He said, he said to me, I think this is cosidiosis, but I'm not going to, because he used to uh, treat his pigeons uh, once a year before the breeding season and all that. He would treat them all for cosidiosis and all that. But he said, I'll bring him to the vet. Now, he brought him to the vet, and the vet said, oh, it was just the strain of flying, and that, and he, he, he gave him a, a prescription for something else, but it wasn't for cosidiosis. But the pigeon died after a few days, and uh, we, we got we got it in mortuary test and an, an autopsy done on him and it was cosidiosis that he had developed either in the basket or wherever he was eating Perfect. on his way home but uh, it's amazing that, that the pigeon yeah got his heart and soul quite literally yeah to go home for 12 in 12 days into dublin from palamas i'm actually i'm 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 good. I'm good that he actually passed after three days. That that's shocking. Three or four days. Three or four days. He got shocking. ill. He lasted for another yeah. few day, days and then passed away. I mean, you have, you have to you have to give it to pigeons like that. Like I mean, that's that's just something. That's I'm not stopping. I'm yeah. going to keep moving. Yeah. That pigeon, obviously, you know, whatever the, whatever way the race was going at that time, the boards are probably still predominantly going into Europe, I'd say, or or, or up into the UK. Yeah. Pigeon gets up into the UK and like boards today coming up out of France, they have to turn left. They have to turn left and face 70, yeah. 80, 90 miles of open water before they can get home. Yeah. So, I mean, the absolute heart, the yeah. heart in the boards. And do you remember over the years, because this, he was obviously a six-year-old cock when he did Palamas, was there any boards bred from him prior to it? And were they ever successful, children or grandchildren, down from this pigeon before he ended up doing Palamas? Were, were they, because he was obviously he was obviously after flying the King's Cup three times and, and, yeah. and the Nard, so he was well worth the salt. Oh, or the man, right. he was well worth the salt. So you would have obviously bred from that. Well, well, remember. Yes, we had pigeons now, definitely. I mean, Raymond and I would have got a share in them, and they, they, uh, they proved successful for us, and mm. they were very hardy, hardy yeah. pigeons. They could take a rough day, you know. You'd, you'd know you were going to get them. Yeah, yeah. Whether early or late, but you got them, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, like, I'm pretty much a staple diet of, of maple peas back then. Yeah, I mean, clean maize. Clean maize. Peas and uh, linseed, flaxseed, you know. Yeah, and and, and, and what, what was, like, the overall condition of your lofts at the time? Because they would have been back then open lofts very much so. The, the, the closing lofts kind of only really hit in the 70s and 80s. Um, 
and, and I'm sure because they're open to the elements, I mean, there was probably very little sickness in the lofts at the time anyway. Uh, well, there, there wasn't, but, uh, you know, um, nature takes care of its boards, say, who are not held in confinement in lofts and all that, so uh, nature, nature will work on those and the fittest and strongest will survive. Mm. But the domesticated animals do need watching. Yeah, yeah. Whether that's birds, dogs, cats, and all. You have to watch out. I mean, they can. Uh, they they <coughs> might not survive out in the wild, but if you just watch for symptoms of illness and all that, yeah. you can so medicate. It's up to the fancier to keep it's up, it's it's up, up to the yeah, it's up to the up to the fancier. And and how many boars they just keep back then? Like the lofts were back garden lofts. You know? Yeah, well. He'd have say twelve nest boxes in in in, in the brazen section and mm -hmm. maybe another section for uh, two small section two or three uh, boxes for uh, your breeders and, yeah. and uh, those eggs then would be transferred into the racing mm -hmm. loft of Pitton's first year or second year um, boards racing but uh so 12 pair of yeah, race boards yeah he hops. didn't he didn't like to use yearlings now as feeders okay. really you know uh well bred really well bred uh yearlings he would take a nest off them and maybe uh put their eggs under feeders and that uh, and the feeders would not be raised. You know, if you had good feeders there, a, a great asset. Mm -hmm. But um, he would breed about maybe 30 young birds right. in the year, you know, and he always bred a, a late bred or two from stock pairs and would use the, the feeders to, to hatch them, you oh, know. So very good. Um, something you, something you mentioned there earlier on about how how conditioned and tame your boards were about that the, you know he'd say up and they yeah. they'd be up to their purchase, and he also mentioned that he he sent his boards uh, unpaired celibate nearly. Well, so was it a kind of a roundabout system or a, or a widowhood system you were racing or, or or was it just because you didn't have a hand there from at the time? Or uh, no, no, he decided just because, as to say, he was. He just smashed keel from the time he was a yearling mm -hmm. and and that. So he just the pigeon was more interested in maize now than mates. <laughs> so <laughs> he just went along with that, you know. And that's look, that's knowing the character of your own boards. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of uh in this day and age a lot of uh I won't say mob flies because Flying thirty pigeons isn't isn't a lot, like, but you you get to know the individual characteristics with with, with less pigeons. It's that's just that's just plain mm -hmm. and simple. The less you have to look after, the more you know them individually. Yeah. Um. So obviously, Christy and his dad knew their boards very very well. Um. I'm just going to show you something here, guys. This is um. Way back when I have a photograph of this, so it'll be up as well. Way back when um. Uh, this is the, the, the actual mealy hen, if I'm not mistaken. No, that's, no, not, just, her. that's not her. No, she was born in 1941. This hen was born around 1920. 20, 29? Oh, 29, my God. 29, yeah. Mealy hen, N-U-D-D. -D. What, what's the, what was the reference there, N-U-D-D? -D? I think it's probably Dublin and District. North, so North Union, Dublin and District Some, or something, something like, like that. that yeah. Uh, 29, yeah. 6, 31. This is from the Dublin Home and Club. It's, it's your father's, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's 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 C, 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 yeah. Yes, C, yeah. And and years ago, this is this is fantastic. You can't get this stuff now. And this is how the this is how it was produced. Uh, all the race results for the year were on uh, all the certificates back then. So every old board race and every young board race, the certificates were printed up uh, with all the top the, the, here the top six boards in every race because there was only that, that's how they did it back then. Um, right up until my time, actually, I remember being at the Dublin Home Club myself growing up, mm -hmm. and it wasn't it wasn't a ten. 10 horse race it was it was six that was it because that's where the money prizes were they were in the top six they weren't they weren't after that like nowadays and um, where you can go up to 10 and 20 sometimes until the pills are all gone but this is the way it was done um and this hen was actually after coming out of penzance she was the winner of the penzance race 
uh, of that year, which was oh, 1930. So we have it down the bottom here, 1930, it says. Um, an amazing, amazing piece of paraphernalia to, to, to be able to to be able to look at. And that was the Dublin Home Club, well-known club in Dublin here, um, which was established, if I'm not mistaken, if I read the article right, uh, the Dublin Home Club was set up in the 20s. Is that right, or the 30s? I, I'm not sure. I yeah. wasn't born until 1940. On the article you've seen at the start of this video, the few the four pages, I've, I've read through it myself after getting it from somebody, and it says that, it, it actually says when the Dublin Home was established, but, it, but Chris is right, it was a, a Dublin district club prior to that. To what? Um, in around the same area in Bollybock, actually, yes, was, where, yeah. was where they were. Um, this is just another... Uh, Certificate we have again from the Dublin Harmon Club, um, a diploma that was awarded to Christy Daly and Son, which is yourself and your father in '68, yes. uh, and again won the P. Marley Cup from Penzance, the Harmon Farm Trophy, which we all know what Harmon Farm is out there at the moment, um, and was the Tr and the Tralee Young Board Cup, um, and it was signed by the Secretary Edward Doyle at the time. Eddie, Eddie Doyle. Eddie Doyle yes. in, in 1968. I mean, amazing. Now Christy has told me he has more paraphernalia. Uh, that goes with all the, the, the racing and the times. So we, we'll have a conversation mm -hmm. uh, another day about getting all those together and I'm going to put together a couple of articles. Um, well, one in particular would be a photograph and a diploma from the National Flying Club. The old King George V yeah. uh, put up the King's Cup wow. uh, for the National Flying Club for the whole of Ireland, the whole yeah. island of Ireland. And it's not what became the King's Cup. That, that was the uh, very, the the very the first. Start. That was the first King's Cup. With the, I, the INFC now, the Irish National Flying Club. Club. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah yes, Irish yes, National yes. Flying Club. But uh, the winner of that first King's Cup race was a man whose surname was Hawthorne of Ligonil. So Hawthorne of Ligonil. And uh, my father and his, uh, who, and his partner in Pittens then was Stuart Kant. Stuart was a very old fancier as well. Him and my father were in partnership. And uh, my father was at work. And we, uh, Stuart clocked the, the, the pigeon uh, that was second in the King's Cup. He was the second board in race time. So uh, I remember Stuart Kant from the time I was a very young lad and he was a very good and kind man, and a, a very good fan. Too. Amazing. Um, let's actually just something I forgot to ask because we, we actually did talk about this. So when the pigeon arrived from Palamas, who was there? How did he get clocked? What was the what was the situation around the actual arrival of the board itself? Well, I, I'd asked my father when I went in. At dinner. I, I drove home from the dock area where I worked, and I asked my father any any sign. This would have been about uh, one o'clock, and he said, "Well, not on, yet." On the twelfth day, on uh, the twelfth day, race. but he, he had a bat out for the young pigeons, and they were in the bat, and uh, but uh, but he said, "I expect them any time so soon," because he says the, uh, the 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 wind has turned; it's from the north now, and. Uh, I think with that dark check hawk, it was liberated with a lot of boards from Northern Ireland. So I think his line of flight was always to the to the north and then back to Dublin. But uh, my father says the wind has changed today. It's from the north, so I expect him any day soon. So I had my dinner, and uh, I just said I'll walk down. Our backyard was a pretty long yard. I walked down the backyard and just to check out. So I walked down and there the Palamas cock was enjoying a bat <laughs> with, with the young birds. So that was it. So I had to get back to work and um, You had to go back to work. I had to go back to work. My family, <laughs> my father clocked and, and I went back to work and uh, what, what was what was the feeling like at the time, can you remember? Like the two years there standing together. Well, this it, fella it, after doing that feat, it was a marvelous feeling and just great admiration for the courage of, of the individual pitching. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. so it, it was grand. But, uh, just grand. How understated is that? Like, well, just grand. I mean, I'd say you guys 
You must have been over the moon. I was too far, you know. Actually, what was the decision to send him to Palma Palance? How did that come about, the decision to send him there? What was... Because obviously he'd done France four times. Mm. He was now a six-year-old cock. Were, were people in Ireland at that time sending their boards that far, or was it just something you guys decided, you know, we're going to have a go at this? Well, there would have been uh, more boards going from Northern Ireland into the British Barcelona Club now than from... To Palamas, they wouldn't send them in oh. those days. Yeah, like, I mean, the King's Cup race would be, was a distant prospect too, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, your pigeon has to have some form before it even goes to the King's Cup. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, um, so, yeah. But th so that's what I'm trying to get at. Why Palamas? Why, why, why Barcelona? Why Palamas? Why, why go so far with them? Because in those days, it was, it was few and far between fanciers had to had the neck, if you want yeah. to call it that, the bravery to send. Boards to have done France four times yeah. on, on another 400 miles. Yeah, but you knew this this pigeon in question. He was a very determined pigeon. Mm. And if you were going to send a pigeon, he had to be the one who was going to send him. It was another mountain to climb. Yeah, that, I, I, maybe that's... That's that's exactly what you've probably hit. One of the reasons I, I love the thought of clocking into Ireland from Barcelona is because it has never been done, no. ever, you know. And and Palamas, I think, is is not much shorter than, than Barcelona. Oh, no, no. There's a very little it's difference not. in it. Yeah. Um, I think the only difference is the Pyrenees. <laughs> Palamas is on one side and Barcelona is the other yeah. side. Um, but an amazing, amazing feat. Like, I mean, 918 miles. Um, so... We've gone through really everything about this absolutely superb pigeon uh, uh, and you're racing with the boards up today. And I know personally from reading the articles of, uh, about your father and that your grandfather Cocker and, and your dad were very, very successful racers all the way right up to, up to France all over the years anyway. Yes. And then yourself has carried that on because I remember you clocking. Um, from from them all, like because I mean you were in the Dublin Home Club and I was a nipper. I, yes. I, I often remember being down there with you, um, and uh, like what was the drive for you? What 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 was the drive to always clock them out the longer distances, the bigger races? Because oh, I yeah. know, yeah. I know if I remember rightly, the South Road Federation Charter specifically has a charter to promote more longer distance racing into Ireland further now rather than the short distance which is what's predominant now. Yeah. Um and was that the goal of most people back it, then? It, it was the distance races, you know, it, it's it's like any sport, you know, and uh when new records have been made and it encourages a lot of young people to come into the sport. Yeah. And people that young people that are already in the sport it encourages encourages them to go further and further, you know. It's just it's just amazing. So this was sixty eight. Yeah. Uh, and after so unfortunately again I'm actually good. <laughs> Cocked on it. Good. But uh life goes on, you moved on, you you are married, you, you have your own family, you have your own race loft. How did your racing career go? You know, as an independent racer, separate from your dad, then and that, like, how, how was that oh, for you? Pre pretty well. I mean, I, I have good few diplomas and, and all that, I just have to look for them. But, uh, <laughs> but talk us but, through some of your uh, some of your best memories of your racing career, like, you know, and how because I actually remember our loft out the back here because I'm actually my parents' house, our loft out the back was, was very high. And we could see the pigeons. Christy from my loft lived down to the, to the east of us. So when the pigeons come in from the UK, you could see the lads down where you are getting. Christy actually lived in the keyhole, That's right. opposite, uh, 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 behind the set house. But you could see the pigeons when they come down, and you knew who was after getting the boards by where they were dropping. Yeah. And um, so, so what what are your best memories of your racing career? Like, you know, how how did that go for you? Well, w one hand in particular. Uh, Check hen, uh, days of back uh, June 1986, she was hatched. She flew the young board race for me as a yearling. She was forced from Mary Bank, 
and I kept training her. Her next race was as a year. Her next race was Penzance. She was first club, first club, uh, second fed, second or third fed, East Coast fed, and that was on the Saturday. And the following Tuesday, I sent her. She was. Uh, I used to slip an odd young board under her and uh, leave her for a few, it wasn't her own young pigeon, uh, leave her um, with the young board in the nest which she protected greatly and then in the evening I would take her away, put her in the pannier where she had water and uh, food trays outside the pannier and I would take her out the next morning, throw her up and uh, she would just give a half a loop around the, the loft and I tried using the sweeping brush to keep her flying and all that <laughs> and she would just come into it and into the trap and back up and I'd have the young board ready and all switched over from the other nest. Mm. But I had lost her <clears throat> partner in the training class, you know, and uh, it was only 30 mile training class and he, he had grown a good few raises from me but um, yeah uh, it was a Saturday when, when I, I won the Penzance race and uh, the following Tuesday I put her into the basket for to the Nard race and uh, it was a pretty hard race Joe Donny won it as five o'clock and he won the Miller Gold Cup by that he, he's won the Miller Gold Cup twice and maybe three times Joe has. I think he's been well up now a couple of times oh, since then oh, yes, he yeah. has Joe, Joe's a well known name yeah. oh, well, well known fancier but um, I, I, I clocked my hen at seven or seven thirteens she'd only four tail feathers left but she was home and uh, I got her in. So she was she was second club, third fed, Denard, and uh, she was a magnificent hen. Is that the hen you were telling me was clocked late? She was the late bread from the year before, is no, that right? No, I that? made it all back to her own son. So the hen that's after flying now yeah, the, the was paired back to her I, own I son. Paired her back to her own son. Okay. Now the father was a cross. It was a cock that had been uh, for John O'Neill. I purchased from John O'Neill of the Premier Flying Club. Uh, it, it was a half brother of Premier Lad who had been, I think, second on on two occasions out of the three or four times that he was in the King's Cup race. A very successful pigeon and I think that had the bloodlines of Joe Downey too, that particular pigeon. But this was a half brother of that cock and I I put my Penzance hen, I made it bored to him because she her side and dam was good and sister, so it was time for a cross. Uh, I had a, one egg, I made it her then the following year back to her own son with the O'Neill cock. Was, uh, I'll get photographs and mm -hmm. I'll give it to Michael at a later date. But uh, she was 10 months old. She was, she was hatched on the 3rd of November and this was a bit of an experiment for me so uh, a pair of very good old feeders who are non racers I let them feed it and at 10 months old I raised it then the following year it was only a couple of months old then for that but uh, I stuck in it to Penzance she was my first pigeon from Penzance and uh, a couple of days later I put her into the King's Cup race you know she was 10 months old there was no day pittance and i found her in the loft the next day 
I had got the week before that I'd got a couple of young birds from uh, friends that Kenny Holiday introduced me to in in Uri and they gave me some bush art pigeons and uh, I had broken five of them. They gave me six, but the uh, the other was a pigeon from Paddy O'Neill, West Belfast, was uh, another pigeon, which she didn't come back, but she was to come back a day later. But she proved to be a very, very good introduction to with this O'Neill cock. She has produced a lot of uh, French birds. One or two for my, my brother and my younger brother Raymond and his son Clifford. But um, this this little hen that I clocked, the 180, 189 open, it was 1990, I think, he was cut. But she was just 10 months old. 10 months ten, old? 10 months old. But not only 10 months old. We, we hear, like, I know today. Actually, to the day, you know. <clears throat> 10 months. So, 10 yeah. months. So, the 3rd of November to the 3rd of July, July. was it? July. Uh, uh, like it just it, it, it beggars belief because you know nobody we, we fear sending the yearlings never mind late bread because mm -hmm. it's not late bread to France now at the moment but a very inbred line of boards so if you remember Christy mentioned the mother of the hen was out of her brother's sister mating yeah. and her herself was a very good race board for you anyway. oh yes, yes she'd yes. also flown France yeah she was then paired to a cock who was a half brother to uh, twice uh, or three times France pigeon France, yeah uh, Premier Lad, who was a, a fantastic line of board. Yeah. So the half brother of Premier Lad, paired to a very, very inbred hen. Yeah. Where she, then, who was second, uh, second to Joe Downey in the middle. Who was second to Joe Downey in the middle Gold Cup of the year. Yeah. Uh, was then paired to this uh, half brother to Premier Lad, as an outcross, who produced a cock, a young cock that was probably raced. No, himself. I never raised him. I so think. he was kept for stock. And I made the it. young cock was paired back to his mother. mother. Yeah, as a yearling. And the inbred daughter then went on to fly as a not uh, uh, as a start racing. If you remember, in April here, was seven months old. Yes. April, May, and June, seven, eight, nine, and ten months old. Then to be sent on to the King's, King's Cup, Cup and to come one hundred eighty ninth open mm -hmm. King's Cup, like amazing, like. I'm a proponent of inbreeding. You've all seen my videos regarding inbreeding and, and what we feel about it, and it's about fixed genetics. Here's a man who, who 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80 years ago with his father and his grandfather before him were proponents of inbreeding. Let's inbreed to fix the genetics, to bring in a cross when it's necessary, yeah. to bring back what we call hybrid vigor now, yeah. and then breed them through the boards. Like, uh, yeah. uh, just amazing. Um, so we're, we're we're nearly up to the nineties, you know. When when you when you decided to to give up the pigeons, I'm sure it was at the at the time. Well, it was a moving house at the time. So know, it was just so. it was just time to, to yeah. let them go. It yeah. was time to let them. Go. And I'm sure, after a life of pigeons, uh, like you're, you're eighty odd years of age. No, so, I'm eighty years of age in January. So eighty in January. Let's correct that. Still only a young man. <laughs> Still a young man. I'm I'm, I'm fantastic. And um, so eighty in January, gave up the boards in ninety eight. So that's almost 19, 20 uh, years 19, ago. Uh, uh, 1998. So 1998. 1998. Sorry. 98. Yeah. So 98, 20, 21 years ago. Now it's, 90, it's 2019, 21 years ago. Have you missed the boards? I do. I, I miss them. I yeah. miss them very much. I loved, I loved uh, just doing the showers in the loft, even just yeah. observing my pigeons, yeah. you know. And we, because it's a lifetime. Yeah, well, my uh, father was a great. A for you. He was a great master to have, you know. Uh, yeah. But uh, one of your probably your probably your biggest influence. Yeah, and, and probably was. his father, his biggest influence. Yes, yeah. You know, amazingly enough, amazingly enough, it's 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 it beggars belief. Um, I have a list of questions here, and and literally we have covered everything, so. I really want to say thank you very much for doing this today because it's so it's information that is out there now. I'll be able to show you the video. You might be able to listen to it rather than hear yeah, than yeah, see it. Yeah. But we, we'll get it on a big enough screen that you can see. Yeah. It. Um. And and I'm excited. Like I'm moving on here now. I I, I, I got rid of army boards last year, as everybody knows. Uh, 
because of personal decisions again things have changed so I, I'm, 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 I'm probably going to end up starting up again uh, you're more than welcome to come up to the loft one of the days yes and, and we, we, I'd we, appreciate we that the, we've gone through the boards and you can handle them yeah and um, what, what I will have there um, look lads I'm banging on about Barcelona for the last it must be five or six years now thinking about that um, it can be done you know Palamos is only the opposite side of the Pyrenees all of the boards, the fifteen to 25,000 boards that can have Barcelona every year, have to cross the Pyrenees. After that, they have to find a way home. Christie's involved in a partnership in 1968 that actually achieved what people say nowadays is unachievable. But it wasn't only done by Christie's board. It was done by a chap up the north, up the north and that was before you guys, wasn't it? Uh, was, yes, yeah. That was before uh, you yeah, guys. I, I, don't, I forget the man's surname yeah. now, but he held a record... Uh, and he sent the same pigeon twice. He sent the pigeon, the first year it was done in 25 days. Yes. And the second year he sent the same pigeon back. back yeah. It was 24 days. Yeah. And like amazing. And people say it can't be done. Yeah. It but can't be done if they're not sent. If they're not sent, exactly. But there are some amazing fanciers up in uh, Northern Ireland. And uh, uh, Nelson Corey, uh, I remember he wanted a bit of scrape pigeon endeavour. Mm -hmm. Endeavour, yeah, I know, Endeavor, I know about that yeah. board, yeah, yeah. So, and the, uh, the walking shower pigeons. Still around today, a lot of the lads up there still racing quite a lot of them, actually, the lads I'm in contact a, a, with. A great line of, of, of race pigeons, but uh, there you go, it's it's a journey in life, not just for the fancier, but for the pigeons that you have, it's a journey. And every time you put them into the basket, you take a risk with them. Even if it's just a 20 or 30 mile toss, it's, you still take a risk every yeah. time you put them in the pannier. Um, I'm actually going to wrap up now because what you have just said there kind of finishes it off nicely. It's right. a journey in life. A journey it's in not life. just for the fancier, but the board as well. Exactly. So let's have a go at Barcelona. Have a go at any of the other internationals. It doesn't have to be Barcelona. Mm -hmm. Christy, thanks very much. Thank you. It's been an absolute, an absolute good pleasure. Good honest good Thank you. I am going to do a couple of articles on this video and what we've talked about. I'm going to get the other paraphernalia off it, yes. off you, and we'll incorporate them into the articles. I'm just so excited again about about going at this. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Right, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.